gives us wisdom in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, we pray. Let every word come from the Holy Spirit this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this is a quick review. James chapter 1, our topic last Sunday. The title was Practicing God's Wisdom in Time of Trials. And we learned about the sufferings of Joseph and how he was sold to slavery. And uh, we thank God for all those trials because James chapter 1 says, count it all joy, amen, when you fall into many, many trials, knowing that your faith is being tested, it produces patience, that we may mature and be complete, lacking nothing, amen. Praise God. So let's continue to endure our, our sufferings, amen, our trials in this world, amen. Now we're going to chapter 2, and the title, we're going to stay with the book of James until we're done, maybe another three, four Sundays. So now we're going to chapter 2, uh, the title is, What is Dead Faith? Amen. James talks about dead faith faith. He warns about having dead faith. So what is dead faith? Amen. First, let's read um, verse, I think James chapter 1, verse 22. Chapter 1, verse 22, before we go to chapter 2. James 1, verse 22. But be doers of the word. And not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Okay. For if <clears throat> anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. Okay, we have some interruption. Just Okay, I, I do apologize for that, sorry. For he observes, for he observes himself, goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, the word of God, and continues to obey it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word. This one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not riddle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. This one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So one principle, be doers of the word, not just hearers only, so that you do not deceive yourselves, verse 22. Is it possible to be deceived as a Christian? Are there Christians who are deceived? Well, Paul, James says, if you are only a hearer, if you don't practice the word, you are deceiving yourself. And we know that the Bible warns about self-deception, uh, self-deceived, self-confessed Christians. Well, are they saved? Probably no, most likely not. That is why we need to learn what dead faith is. Okay, what is dead faith? Well, dead faith does not produce any good works at all. Okay, uh, dead faith only hears but never practices the word. Okay, so if you're doing that, that's a sign of self deception. Okay, and then he, James, makes a, an example here, an illustration. Okay, 
um, when you look at the mirror, you know, those who are hearers only, those who are hearers only, uh, they look at the mirror and immediately they forget how they look like. They can't even remember how they look like, okay? As soon as they leave, they forget right away how they look like, okay? But those who hear the word and practices it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer, amen. He will be blessed in everything that he does. Praise God. So the, the word of God is like a mirror, okay? When we read the word of God, uh, if we really have the Holy Spirit in us, if we are really genuinely saved, the Word of God will always convict us of our shortcomings, of our sins. The Word of God will always remind us who we are in Christ Jesus. And after I read the Word of God, I go home, I, I, go, I, I close my Bible, I continue with my daily chores. I do not forget what I read. I do not forget that I am a child of God. I do not forget that, you know, the Holy Spirit created me in the image of God. That's called born again, uh, regeneration. I do not forget that the Spirit convicted me earlier with impatience or with uh, the wrong use of my language, right? Uh, whatever shortcomings, failures, uh, sins I have committed, I do not forget that the Holy Spirit is dealing with me in that particular issue. So I do not forget all of that because, you know, I am I'm born again. I have the Holy Spirit of God to teach me and remind me. Every time I read the Word of God, the Spirit of God speaks to me. But if you are self-deceived, if you are not a doer, there's no works, okay? Uh, if what you have is dead faith producing zero good works, okay? Uh, you don't remember. Th those people, when they read the Bible, they don't remember anything. They don't get convicted of their sins. Uh, they don't even realize that, you know, what, what the true Christian is. They don't understand all of that. They don't understand Christ's likeness. Uh, they don't understand sanctification, holiness. Uh, they're not interested in obedience. Uh, it doesn't bother them if they don't go to church. It doesn't bother them if they don't pray, if they don't worship, if they don't give. Uh, they just look at the Bible. Sometimes they read it and they get nothing out of it. It 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 it. They're not, uh, the Spirit of God does not convict them. They don't know their true, they don't realize their true condition called depravity. They don't think they are sinners. They don't think they're bad enough. They don't think they're depraved. Uh, they think they're self-righteous, okay? Uh, there's a lot of things they don't get, okay? They think being a Christian only involves going to church, traditions, rituals. Uh, they don't understand what Christ-likeness is. So yeah, it's true. Uh, they look at the word. It's like looking at the mirror and not seeing anything. As soon as they leave, you know, they forgot how, how they even look like, right? Uh, but a true Christian who has the spirit, every time he looks into the mirror of God's word, he gets revelation all the time. Amen? Can you say amen? Amen. amen. So, And then not only revelation, uh, the word of God is producing. Their faith is not dead. It is producing good works. It is producing fruit. Amen. It is producing prayer. It is producing faithfulness, commitment, obedience. It is producing giving. It is producing sacrifice. It is producing endurance, patience. Amen. Because that person is a doer of the word. He is a doer. One who practices.
the word. He's not just a hearer, but a doer. Amen. So James warned that if you are just a hearer, you are deceiving yourself. You are deceiving yourself. Uh, Self-deception. Okay. And then verse 26, another warning. If you think you are religious, if anyone among you thinks he is religious, but does not control or bridle or discipline his tongue, his religion is useless. Now we know that we are not saved by religion. But by we are saved by relationship, by faith in Jesus. We are saved by rege regeneration, regeneration or born again, not by religion. Okay, if you have a religion, well, how do you know people who are religious? Well, it's right here in verse twenty-six. They don't bridle their tongue, but they go to church. See. Uh, they don't discipline their language, their mouth, but they go to church, okay? James says, if any one of you thinks you are religious, but you do not control your tongue, you deceive your own heart. Read again verse 26. But deceives his own heart. Such person is self-deceived, Okay? Then James defines what true religion is. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their trouble. And to keep oneself unspotted, uncorrupted by the world. See, a person who is not identified with the world or corrupted by the world. A person who is... Who knows how to demonstrate compassion, right? Helping the poor, the widows. And he keeps himself pure. That is the true and pure religion. Amen. Because that kind of faith is producing good works. Christ-likeness. Amen. So what is James' argument? Well, if you have religion but you don't control your tongue... You don't have compassion, no good works, no commitment, no obedience. Uh, you are deceiving your own heart. James calls this dead faith. Amen. So examine ourselves. What do we have? Dead faith or genuine saving faith? Remember, my argument is always this. If you are truly saved, you will look like Christ. Yes. Amen? Well, maybe you are still far from being like Christ, but you are on the way to being like Christ. Every day you grow until you die. And after five years, ten years, you become more and more like Christ. Amen? And if you stop doing good works, it bothers your conscience. If you stop going to church, if you stop giving, if you stop praying, if you stop worshiping, if you don't discipline your stewardship, the way you spend your money, if you don't help the poor, if you don't give to God, if you're still greedy, if you're still materialistic, if nothing is really changing, are we deceiving ourselves? Are we self-deceived? If we are cursing, we don't have patience, are we just counterfeit Christians? Is that dead faith? Amen. Are we just hearers only? So yes, uh, the principle is very clear. Genuine salvation will always produce Christ-likeness, good works. Remember Romans 8, 28. God predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. God saved us. He called us that we might be conformed to the image of his son. Romans 8, verse 29. 
Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, God predestined us to become holy and blameless in Christ Jesus. He predestined us to adoption, to become children of God, to become holy and blameless, to, to be conformed to the image of Christ. So that's how you know if you have dead faith or not. Amen. Praise God. So it's easy, brothers and sisters. It's easy to know if you are genuinely saved. Uh, actually, yesterday, we were at Seafood City just to get some takeouts. And uh, if, if you want to see Filipinos here, you go to Seafood City. 98%, 99% of people eating in Seafood City are Filipinos. Workers, Filipinos, Filipinos everywhere. And in the parking lot, when we were leaving the mall, uh, another Filipino guy driving his car, uh, he stopped right in front of me. He literally blocked my car and gave me a bad look, a bad stare, uh, as if I did something stupid. And then I asked myself, why do you have to block me? Why do you, do you have to give me that look? Okay, I did not crash into your car. I was just creeping slowly. And as soon as I saw him, I stopped my car. He had plenty of room to move in front of me. But this is probably a driving instructor. He wants everything perfect. I mean, almost every driver will do the same thing. You creep a little bit, check, so until you can have a full view. If you see another car, you stop. And that's what I did. Every driver does that. But he didn't like that style of driving, he gave me a bad look. And I felt like, what right do you have to bully me? See, something in me started to boil. And I have this question, you don't have that right to bully me. You don't have that right to give me that good look. I did not cry. You, didn't, you don't have the right to give me that bad look, that angry look. I did not crash into your car. You just go and disappear. I. I stopped on time, I gave it right away, you just disappeared, that's all you need to do. Uh, but he was a bully, okay? And somehow, something in me started boiling after that. Um, well, you know, and then I realized, praise God, I have the Holy Spirit. I have two choices, I can literally chase his car, block him, stop in front of him and confront him. Uh, and then, speak about my rights, right? What right do you have to bully me? That's a bad attitude, right? Well, I can chase him and argue with him, but I said, well, do Christians do that? Do people who have the Holy Spirit do that? I didn't like what he did, but, you know, that's all I can do. I, I was disgusted, but I can't be violent. I can't swear. I can't uh, allow rage, uncontrolled anger to to take place. I just okay, just let it go. Don't ruin your day. A lot of good things are happening today. Don't let this small irritation bother you. So I let it go. So that's how you know. Do you have if you have patience or not? If you are a genuine Christian, remember James chapter one. Count it all joy when you get harassed, bullied. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Patience. How do you know if you have the Holy Spirit? If you're genuinely saved, do you have patience? Amen. So if I chase him around and took away my steering lock as a weapon and started smashing on his windows, well, you know, that's not the work of a Christian. Christians don't work behave in such a manner, right? We don't react in such a manner. Because we are believers. We have the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit will convict us. Because God has given us patience, self-control, and we brittle our tongue. Right? Are you quick to say the F word? No, right? We brittle our tongue. Now, if you don't control your tongue, if you're impatient, that's not pure and undefiled religion. 
It's called dead faith. It's a bad religion. Amen. It's a hypocritical religion. It's a dead, empty, external religion like the Pharisees. Amen. The Pharisees, Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. Okay. Let's go now to chapter 2. Amen. Let's talk about, let's talk more about dead faith. Faith without works. Okay. Verse 14, chapter 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if, if it does not have works, is dead. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his own son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, his faith was made perfect. Verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Let's stop right there. It's a long chapter, eight, a long passage. It can be quite confusing to read this, okay? But to understand this better, uh, James is not saying that we are saved by good works. That's not what James is saying. The Bible is still clear. We are saved by faith, by the grace of God. We are saved by grace through faith alone. No works needed. Okay, All it takes is genuine faith in Jesus. Amen. We are saved by the grace of God. It's a free gift to us. Paul said it is not of human works so that no man can boast. Salvation is a free gift received by grace alone through faith. No one can boast that I got saved because I am a good person, because I did this and do that. You cannot boast that, okay? Because we were all born in depravity, amen? We're all born in sin. Uh, all that's needed to get saved is to believe in Jesus Christ. But again, after you are saved, good works will follow. Remember what Paul said in Ephesians 2 verse 10? God created us for good works. We are his workmanship created for good works. After we are saved by faith, by grace, good works will follow because it was God who created us for good works. He regenerated us. He made us a new creation. Born again so we can now produce good works because we are God's workmanship. He recreated us for good works. But it is not the good works that saved you. It is only faith that saved you. But because you have genuine faith, it will eventually produce good works. Here is the same principle. James is saying here that if you have faith, if you say you have faith, but there is no good works, 
it is not genuine faith, right? It is not genuine faith. Amen. You know, we have a saying, we have a saying uh, that says, actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. Okay, who is a true saved Christian? Let me give you an illustration. Two Christians, Christian A and Christian B. Christian A keeps telling the whole world he is a Christian. Every time he meets a person, uh, a stranger, he will say, I am a Christian. At work, he will say to everyone, I am a Christian. His whole relatives, family, I am a Christian. Christian B, person B, he does not say he's a Christian, okay? He doesn't tell the whole world he's a Christian, okay? But you see person B uh, very much like Christ. He has Christ likeness. He has patience. He has commitment. You see him every Sunday, God first. His priority in life, Sunday morning, God first. When it comes to his finances, God first. He doesn't have any excuses. When it comes to praying and worshiping, he starts his day with prayer and worship. So his lifestyle is demonstrated with obedience. So who do you think among the two? is the true Christian. Who do you think among the two has dead faith? Who do you think among the two has genuine faith? See, it's easy to uh, judge. If I were to make a choice, I will choose, if, I, if, if this is uh, like a game that you have to guess, I would conclude easily that Christian B, person B is the genuine Christian. Okay? Because person A just had a road rage, you know? Because person A just committed adultery, just as usual, again and again and again. Uh, person B, sorry, person A uh, only goes to church once a year, right? Christmas, Thanksgiving. He does not help the poor. He has no compassion for the poor. Uh, no works to prove. No evidence of genuine salvation. There's zero evidence of genuine faith. So this is what James is talking about. Faith without works is dead. Amen. You know, I will not apologize for my teaching because I'm teaching the word of God. You know, I really, if there are listeners out there who gets angry with my message, well, you know, God, I am God's mouthpiece. God called me to, to preach the gospel and to speak the truth. Okay? My intention here is not to insult, not to offend people, but to lead them to that narrow path. You know, a lot of self-deceived Christians are entering the broad gate. The broad gate, Jesus warned the broad gate will lead you to destruction, perdition. But narrow is the path that leads to everlasting life. Narrow. If you want to enter the kingdom of God, you have to agree with James. You have to agree that faith without works is dead. Amen? That if you don't have works, you need to examine your heart. You could be deceiving yourself. Amen. Okay. This is the entire argument in James chapter 2. If you just say to the person, God bless you, brother. You see the poor. You see the needy. God bless you, brother. But you don't extend a helping hand. It profits nothing. It profits you nothing. It's dead faith. Okay? Uh, and then, 
James mentions that even devils believe in God. You know, it's always easy to say, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus. But James says, do you not know that even demons believe in God? But are demons saved? Right? Uh, you know, when, when the demon possessed saw Jesus, the demon cried with a loud voice, Son of God, did you come here to torment us? See, e even the demons know Jesus through identity. They believe he is the Son of God, but they are not saved. Okay? Because it's dead faith. Okay? So not everyone who says, I believe in God, has saving faith. Most of them are dead faith. Okay? Also, James, uh, the second example, uh, number one, demon. Second example is Abraham. Okay. Can you say Abraham was a counterfeit Christian? Can you say that Abraham had dead faith? No. It's easy to, to judge. You know, if you read the Old Testament, Genesis, you would easily know that Abraham was declared by God as a true Christian. He was declared by God as righteous. How did Abraham became righteous? Because he believed God. Okay? Look at this. Uh, Abraham believed God and it was charged to him. It was counted as righteousness. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Where was that? Uh, verse 23. The scripture says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Okay. In other words, Abraham was justified, declared righteous by God because of his faith. He believed God. But again, James also defended he he uh, he argued, James argued that Abraham's faith is not just uh, self-confession. Uh, Abraham's faith produced works. Okay? Because James says that Abraham sacrificed his own son. Okay? Where was that? I'm just looking for that. Uh, verse 21. Here's James' argument. Was not Abraham our father? Did he not offer Isaac on the altar? Did, you, did not Abraham offer his own son Isaac at the altar? Okay. Verse 22. Do you see that his faith was working together with his works? And because of his works, his faith was made perfect? Okay. Do you have perfect faith? Do you have genuine faith or dead faith? How do you know if faith is genuine or perfect? If it is producing obedience. Like Abraham obeyed God. When God told him. Offer your own son. He obeyed. He obeyed. He sacrificed his own son. So we know that Abraham was truly saved. He did not have dead faith. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Now, let me give you some heartbreaking examples of my experiences in 30 years. I know you don't know this person because this is in the span of 30 years. It would be hard for you to guess who is who. I've pastored 30 years. Believe me, trust what I'm about to say. I know a person who considers himself a brother, a Christian. But he hates tithing. 
he hates giving. Of course, in our when he was in our church, nobody forced him to tithe or to give. But he is totally indifferent to the subject of giving. He left our church, moved to another church. And one time I had the discussion with his pastor because I know his pastor. And same thing, his pastor told me, you know, your former member, he just don't want to give. No matter, you know, JIL teaches tithing. Uh, they encourage everyone to tithe, but they don't force. But according to that pastor, such person has a deaf ear when it comes to giving. He just don't believe in it. Okay? So, true. Some Christians don't believe in obedience. Some Christians don't believe in sacrifice. Some Christians don't believe in commitment, going to church every Sunday. I encourage another former member. And my wife asked this guy directly, how do you feel about not going to church? Because that person works every Sunday. Nothing. That's the response. Nothing. He just gave us a smile. That's it. Just smile at us. Well, you know, we don't have the right to judge him. But when he stands before God, he will have no excuse. He cannot say that, well, I didn't know about it. I didn't know we were commanded to go to church every, to worship God, to go into the house of the Lord. He cannot say he was ignorant. We were there. We admonished him. We reminded him, brother, you go back to church. Support your family. Because your wife needs your support. How can they, how can your family go to church without you? You know, you are in a position where you can do something, right? You can reject Sunday work. You can say, I'm not going to church every Sunday. If you have that option, if you can make an arrangement with your employer, you, you can choose God and prioritize on him. But if you're not doing anything to make things work and still you think you're a Christian, well, you know what James says? What did James say here? That's dead faith. That's self-deception. Uh, do you not know that Abraham, when he was called to sacrifice, he obeyed? And because of that, his faith was made perfect. Because faith and works were working together. Faith was producing works and works was the evidence of genuine salvation. Well, you know I believe the story of Abraham was written in the Bible for us to follow. It, it was recorded in Genesis to be an example to us of what it means to be born again, what it means to be genuinely saved, what it means to be a true believer, what it means to have perfect faith, not dead faith. See? Amen. Amen. So here's my final warning. In 30 years, I've dealt with a lot of people with dead faith. My final warning again, we shall all be judged before God on judgment day. All our works will be examined. Every person. God will examine you what kind of Christian you are and what kind of work you performed. And then this is James' conclusion, okay? He said, do you not know that faith without works is dead? Okay, and then in verse 26, James says, for us the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Can I repeat it? This is James' final argument. Okay. I hope I, James, the word of God, will convince you today to obey. Okay, James says the body without the spirit is dead. You go to the morgue. It's very easy to know if the person is still breathing or not. If the person is truly dead or not. Just put your finger here. No pulse. Talk to the person. No hearing. He can't hear you. Ask him a question. He can't talk back. 
unable to speak, unable to hear. And wave your hand. He doesn't see you. Shake him. Sit him on a chair. He'll fall back. He'll collapse. Because a body without a spirit is dead. So, in the same way, faith without, verse 26, works is dead also. Faith without works is dead also. Wow. So if I confess that I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian, but I don't have works, I'm a counterfeit pastor. I'm a fake pastor. Uh, if I'm still a drunkard, adulterer, just like in the 80s, Am I still, if I, if I still use drugs, uh, alcohol, uh, substance abuse, if I still cheat on relationships, that's like the 80s, well, that's faith without works. It's like a dead body in the morgue. No life at all. No signs of life. No signs of life. Amen. So brothers, I posted on my profile, you know those quotes that you see on Facebook? Those are all original. I make those quotes. I don't copy them. I make those quotes based on my theology, my understanding of the Word of God. One of the posts I made is, it's a question. And here's the question. Can you be truly saved? Can you be a true Christian without any signs of life? Without any signs of life? Just like the dead person in the morgue. Can you say a person is alive if there is, no, if there is zero sign? Do you know how the doctor declares you are dead in the hospital? They will check for vital signs. No pulse, no hearing, no heartbeat, no circulation. Then they make an official document saying that this person died on June 10, June 11, just as the service was starting, just as Pastor Alvin was starting to preach, this person died at 10 o'clock, June 11, 2023. This person died because zero signs of life no vital signs i know it because that's what they did to my parents when they died after they died they checked for vital signs and they told officially the family they're gone okay so a body without a spirit is dead in the same way a Christian who has zero sign of life is not a Christian. It's called dead faith. And you know what? I said that with passion. You know why? Not that I'm judging, but I want if I can shake someone, stop it. Stop doing that. And that person becomes alive. Then I have saved that person, isn't it? Can you say amen? If you are choking, okay, if you can't breathe, you can't talk because you just swallowed a large piece of meat in your throat and I don't do anything to save you. I don't do that maneuver, you know, pressing your abdominal with force. I forgot what that maneuver is. If I don't do anything so that that piece of meat is, you know, forced, if I don't forcibly eject that meat out of your mouth by using this kind of maneuver, if I don't do anything to save you, you're going to die. And then when I stand before God, God will say to me, you were there and you didn't do anything. I know I'll have a lot of enemies here. I'll have a lot of enemies here. 
Because a lot of dead people are content and happy just the way they are. Can you just deny it? That's true. But you know, I'm an evangelist. I was called to save lives and to preach nothing but the truth. That, so, so this morning, I've done my job. You know, I talked about dead faith. I talked about what it means to have dead faith. I warned about self-deception. And again, the body without the spirit is dead. So examine your type of Christianity. Our goal, I'm not saying that I'm a perfect person. You know, uh, yesterday I was tempted with road rage. But I know I'm a Christian because I did not chase that guy. I did not try to provoke him or, or triggered, you know, or escalated the situation. You know, I could have just stepped on the, on the gas a second time and just stopped six inches from his bumper. I could have done that and got out of my car and talked to him. What's your problem? Right? But, you know, if I did that, I would have no face to preach today because a genuine Christian cannot behave in such a way. A genuine Christian cannot steal from God. You know what Malachi said? People who don't give, they're stealing from God. Right? You know, it's very hard to be a Christian, to tell you honestly. It's very difficult, but you know, it is worth it. Because when we stand on Judgment Day, you know, we are expecting God to acknowledge us. You know, we don't expect Jesus to say, I never knew you. Right? We expect Jesus to say, well, you fought a good fight. You fought a good fight. And I was glorified. You tried to live the Christian life. You, you depended on the power of God, on the Holy Spirit. Your faith was made perfect because of works. You did not grieve the Holy Spirit of God all your life. Yes, you were not perfect. You failed. You had failures. But you were consistent in not grieving. You did your best not to grieve the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. You know what that faith is? That faith is when you can grieve the Holy Spirit on a daily basis because you don't have the Spirit at all. You don't have Christ anyway. It's all dead religion. See? So, brothers and sisters, my message is finished. I have delivered the Word of God unfiltered, uncompromised. I did not try to soften it like the fake prosperity preachers on online. Counterfeit false teachers, I did not soften it. I did not filter it. I did not choose my words. I delivered the word of God accurately, explicitly. And again, my apologies if you got hurt, but I'm here to save you. You're choking, and I hope that piece of meat in your throat, you will vomit it out and start living again. If I have achieved that, glory to God. That's called salvation if you respond with this message by believing in the lord jesus repenting of your sin surrendering your heart to jesus christ and then doing your best to obey you have done your part it's called genuine faith god bless you let's pray now lord heavenly father we thank you we thank you for what we have learned today we know james the book of james is a powerful book it is very convicting. You know, James never tried to soften the power of the tongue. He calls it a small, deadly member of our body, small but terrible. James never softened the word of God. He says those who are just hearers only are self-deceived. James never tried to make the word of God appeal to sinners. He did not water it down. He spoke it. I have spoken it as it should be spoken. And the rest is in your hands now. Father, may the Holy Spirit 
now do a major surgery in the hearts of the listeners. And I pray many will come to saving faith because of the preaching of the gospel in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for your patience. You sat there one hour digitally. Thank you for feeding, receiving the word of God. Thank you so much. Special shout out to all of you out there. Jun Diaz. Jun Diaz, Brother Jun Diaz is there. Alona. Sister Alona. Yes. Ati Tess, thank you. Brother Al and uh, Atara, Sister God Carmen. Bless. God bless. God bless you, Brother Al. Thanks for watching. We miss you guys. We miss all of you. <laughs> we'll see you in Vancouver next Sunday. God bless you. Thank you.